Executive State of Mind. Exec- executive State of Mind. Hi everyone, this is the Executive State of Mind, a show that dives deep into the tech world with leading industry figures. I'm Lior Schechter, CTO at Natural Intelligence, and today we'll talk about the evolution of web products. With Yoav, Chief Architect and Head of Wix Code, we'll go through uh, the evolution of web products from simple uh, HTML composed in uh, simple editors through the drag and drop workbenches which Wix pioneered, and also discuss the next evolution, the generative AI era, the challenges and opportunities that comes with it. Hi, Yoav. Hi, I'm very glad to be here. A pleasure to have you here. So let's get rolling with a few uh, warm-up questions. <laughs> so first, what inspired you to pursue a, a career in tech? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your role as a chief architect at Wix. Okay, so uh, to be honest, when I was uh, growing up, I was thinking I would love science. Uh, but my direction was probably to go and be a physicist or maybe a pilot or maybe something in those areas. I actually learned when to learn physics and uh, computer science. And the idea was that computer science would just pay the bills while the real interest is physics. Okay. And then I actually went and did uh, also a master's in physics, high energy physics. But at the same time, one of my friends in... Uh, In the university, he told me, hey, they're looking for someone in our startup. Maybe you want to, to look at it. And that was a very high-paying salary over almost, actually over 20 years ago. And since then, I joined the high tech industry. For, I went for, it was seven, nine years in that startup. Started from a developer, then an architect role, Then we were sold to Amdox, sorry, sold to Kramer that was sold to Amdox. What was the name of the startup? T-Soft. T-Soft. Okay. And ended up from growing from a 16-people company to be an architect of over a thousand people division in Amdox. And at the same time, my two brothers and a friend of them created a, their own startup. It didn't really have any chance. It was something really... A, I, no one will, could believe that it would work. You know, something to create websites. And uh, two years later, they were like, come here, we need your help to scale this thing up. They were like, hey, we have uh, this problem. Uh, you know, we're doing Flash websites. And, well, there's the iPhone. It does run Flash. But there's also the iPad, which was just introduced, and it doesn't run Flash. And... Uh, The future of the web of the web is going to be the iPad everyone knows that the future of the web is going to be iPads so what do are we going to do about it yes that was 2010 yeah that I was remember. 2010 yeah I remember this and a month later they had a conversion of a flash website into HTML and then we found something really really problematic really awful you looked you took the iPad and you looked at the website converted from flash to HTML and And it looks beautiful, looks exactly the same thing. But you have no idea where you're going to press. And then you realize that when you have a mouse, you're moving the mouse over the screen, over the website, and see what reacts to the mouse, then you know where to click. But in iPad, you don't have a mouse. Yeah. A, we need to build websites differently on mobile. And that was the start of uh, another advent- adventure in Wix. And when, since then, I'm basically at Wix. Uh, perfect. So l- let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, uh, web evolution. Um, so a lot has changed uh, the world of development in uh, the last decade or two. Maybe you can take us through your experience or pers- in perspective of key transformation uh, in web development. Web development. Web development is, I think it's super exciting. I think that we are uh, at the end break of a third age of web development and take it towards a little bit explanation what are the, those uh, those generations of web development you know people that are as old as I am I assume you are I don't know if you're my age but probably you've seen that uh, the yeah. web started with things like PHP and CGI which were uh, static 
which were servers that would generate an HTML page. Yeah, I started in the BBS, you know. Exactly, like then BBS. Then in the 19th, in the 90s, yeah. It, uh, all that starts around 95. Yeah. And they would create a static HTML page that the browser would show. That was the first age of the web. And still, a lot of the web is built that way. Yeah. Then we had the age, we call it 1.5, which was adding some interactivity into the web using JavaScript. And jQuery was kind of the... that thing for that age. But all of that was geared toward, you know, the ASP and PHP and uh, JSP and all of the SP different technologies. Yeah. Then the second age started with uh, Angular. That was where we started creating client first web frameworks. And those client first web frameworks allowed the JavaScript developers to take the lead and render the full web application On the client and that was a huge success because it moved us you know light years ahead but then they started seeing another difficulty and that is you know angular react view all of those frameworks they created single page applications but they were applications they weren't websites in order to be a website we need to understand that a website existence is Is to be a target for search engine and a target for social because at the end the money comes from the ads being paid and driving the traffic back to the website in order to do that you need SEO and you need the search engine to be able to see what's going on yeah. on the website in order to do that you need to render all the website on the server and then the client frameworks are not compatible with that so we started to creating this the second and the half age which were you know frameworks that would render some of the react pages on the server as caches for search engines and then things like next js which would make your application able to run on the client and on the server at the same time or you know all kinds of different things like that and now we're starting to go into another age which is the third age which is again a creative area and By the way, anytime we moved from one edge to another, we had a, a creative area, a creative time where a lot of different frameworks were created. And now when we understand that we need to create a framework that is a server side and client side together, doing both of them as first class citizen, and maybe even taking the build time again as the first time citizen, and maybe starting to tackle other aspects like the designer, which is all, was, all, was left out of the process up until now, And we are now in a creative area. And we can see that with Quicks that uh, Mishko Avari is working on. We can see that with signals that are being uh, promoted all across frameworks. We can see that with a lot of the innovation going around designed to code. Yeah. We don't know where we're going to get to in that third age, but we see that shift coming up to, for us. What are the top three milestones uh, that you remember from your time in Wix that are related to, to this evolution? Ooh, I think... I think first the first milestone is Wix itself. You know, before Wix, yeah. b- making a website was a very expensive process. And he, you know, when, I, when Wix was founded, everyone, including myself, by the way, were like, website is a solved problem. Why do yeah. we need <laughs> this thing? But apparently, we did. We did need a way to bring a website to be as easy as creating a document or creating a presentation. So that was the first milestone of Wix. The second milestone, which uh, I was involved with already, is going mobile and going HTML. The first thing was su- let's support mobile, but then it was let's support yeah. HTML. And that was moving from a flash, which was a great technology, but it wasn't uh, the best going forward in time and moving to something very, very standard. And third, that was uh, the Wix app market. The Wix app market was a way to uh, incorporate third-party applications and components into a Wix website in a way that we can let partners do that. You are uh, heading uh, Wix code? Yes. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about what it is, uh, what's the story behind it, how it is uh, um, inside the Wix portfolio. Um, so uh, I'll start by you know, very simply what it is. We've taken the ideas of cloud computing, you know, 
compute, a serverless compute and serverless database. We took Wix, which is a drag and drop a web a designer, you know, for, to build websites, and we connected those two together. So what you get is something which is very unique. But before going into, into more details about it, let me tell you a little bit about the story, what happens behind it. When I've created the Wix app market in 2013, you know, it was success. But then we figured out that there is friction. And the friction, we've seen that when we went to, to hackathons or different places. And when someone needed to create a new application, the first thing was, A, get a server, get a database. You need to render H HTML. You need to render iframes. Yeah. That is the big friction point. And so the next thing we were thinking, let's see how we can remove this friction point. Let's make it easy. Maybe, why do you not even need a server for the web? Ah, we only need a server because for authentication and cross-domain, course, wasn't very successful at the time. Okay. And maybe we can give you that as a generic facility. Let's create this proxy that we do that. That has failed. We tried it, it failed. So then when we student, we need to provide the solution that to make it easier. And this is kind of where the idea of taking cloud computing and taking Wix and connecting them together grew up from. Seven years moving forward, today we have a platform where it is very easy to create a customer facing web applications. Think about things like from access to WordPress to anything that you want your customers to interact with, but you can actually connect to and build the application on Wix or even connect to your enterprise. And you can, for instance, you can create a site to rent a car very easily. Or we can create a site for your bank to let you open an account and transfer money. And you can build a, a whole startup just on Wix. We actually have quite a few startups that have just built on Wix. And what you gain is development velocity, which is unparalleled. It is 10 times faster than anything else that you can do on the web. So you mentioned also a design to code yes. uh, concept. You know, it, it, it uh, naturally gain, gaining more traction in recent uh, years and months. So first, again, if you can explain what it is, um, and uh, how do you think it will change the way we evolve and build uh, the web? So I think, I think this is probably the biggest revolution that we're going to see. And uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, executive state of mind. I assume that people know about DevOps, heard about the, the DevOps revolution we had 10 years ago, yep. uh, which is, to summarize, shifting responsibility, letting the developer deploy to production and see the impact of what they've done, taking responsibility for that. Design to code is basically letting the designer become part of the dev team, being able to change the design of the application and deploy a new design without the developer. So we are going to, for a, another layer of, of abstraction, uh, to non-programmers or non-professional -prof programmers, allowing them to, to do the web evolution. Yes, and we need to understand what, what it's trying to solve. In the case of developer and operations, we solve the friction point. Developer would say, I'm ready, and then let the operation do stuff. The operation would try to install, maybe it's running, maybe not. When it didn't work, they would put all kinds of off guards. Those guards would slow down the developer, and yeah. we know the problems there. Today, what happens is the designer designs stuff on Figma, and then it gives and some export to the developer that needs to rebuild the same design. Yeah. So we're now we're taking that same graphic design and we're building it twice. And because it's different people, there's going probably to be mistakes. So then the designer will go back to the developer and say, fix this and fix yeah. that thing. And if the developer, if the designer changes their mind, and they will, because you know that's the real world, changes do happen then the developer will need to, again, re-implement that. That creates a lot of friction, creates a back and forth process that is never a good thing, never a good idea. What if the designer would have been able to go and implement the design in the dev project directly? Yeah. You know, sounds like science fiction. Well, there are already ways to do that. We actually, in Wix, we have two ways to do that already. Velo, 
you can use the designer is using Wix to design the application front end, and the developer just writes the code behind the scenes. And we have a new product we're working on called Codux, which lets the designer join a React project and changes the React code in a visual environment. One of the interesting questions is, yeah, 80 or 90 percent, you know, of the design change, changes don't break anything. What happens when, yeah, someone added a button or removed the button, and now uh, uh, the flow has changed, and, and you do need an engineer, you know, to interfere? I think that's part of the challenge. Yeah. But as I said, 80% is simple. Yeah. Today, we don't have any way to measure the usefulness of an application, usability of an application. Yeah. We don't have a way to measure uh, how good looking it is. But those are things that maybe AI can solve. Maybe tomorrow we're going to have an AI bot that given an application will give us a usability score. And then the designer or the developer can go and fix something. And if that usability score goes up, that's great. If it goes down, maybe, hey, let's stop this deployment. Maybe it creates us a problem. Same, we can do the same with design. Okay. You know, all of that area is something that we haven't really gotten to, and it will be really interesting to see where, where the industry goes there. You mentioned Velo, your full-stack development platform. Uh, maybe you can tell us what sets it uh, uh, apart from Wix uh, previous uh, products? So Wix, Wix, Wix regular products are you know, building a website, drag and drop. Uh, Editor X is a, a more professional way to build products, more, more professional in terms of being pixel perfect for the designer. Yeah. And then we have the Wix applications, the app market. You can add, you can drag and drop and add, add capabilities into your website, like you know, stores, booking, events, a counter, things like that. But every so often, you need more tailored capabilities. And those more tailored capabilities can range from... A, you know, something I had in the weekend, a, a button that you click and it uh, just raise one in the counter. He, another thing might be to create a game, like a tic-tac-toe game. Or another thing might be to rent a car, which is, again, a very special use case. And what we're seeing is that the more you upscale in terms of your the complexity of the project, the more tailored solutions you need. And this is where Velo comes in. And we're seeing it gives us the capability to uh, basically support any project. You know, we don't need to code. But the way to, maybe another way to think about it, in regu in regular way, you know, you have your product and then you have start to have a very long tail of uh, features. And because you have limited number of developers, you can only build so much and all the long tail, you'll never support it. Yeah. Velo comes in to support all of that long tail because we let our users or partners working for them to develop anything they want on Wix. Yeah, so naturally, it, uh, it, uh, uh, it relates more to enterprise clients, I reckon, that want to build their own portal. So what are the most important factors for these clients uh, to consider when choosing web uh, development partner? And how do you think Wix cater to these needs? I think... Uh, when we say Velo and we say enterprise, we're looking at a huge market and, lo and a lot of diversity in terms of uh, different clients. You know, enterprises have challenges today with the web because a, a regular web project takes a lot of time. And when a project takes a lot of time, you're going to do like two of them a year, maybe three, four of them a year. I think the main value that we give an enterprise is the ability to, to do uh, 50, maybe 100 projects a year to work much, much faster. You know, first, it's the ability to let a, to utilize the fact that in Wix, you don't need to code. So marketing teams can create websites without developers, without IT, which makes it much easier in terms of regulation, in terms of process, yeah. in terms of rolling out stuff. But then it also lets you the ability to actually do code when you need it. And then you can start creating smart campaigns. You can start creating solutions for franchises. If I need, if I have a, you know, one example that we've seen is a company that sells uh, chairs and they are use their franchise. They have uh, over 200 partners that are selling their catalog. 
and we have a solution to let them offer the partner a website with okay. the catalog and the catalog can be in sync with the parent company catalog so now you you know you can they introduce a new kind of chair it automatically goes to those all 200 uh, 200 partners generative AI has exploded on the scene what would be the role of AI in website development in few years and maybe you can tell us how wix is preparing for this future there is a it's going to impact everything we're doing to give you two examples that we're already doing today one we let you generate texts for your website already today with an AI and we're working on having an AI a code assistant that would help uh, users to code at least simple things you know more common things you yeah. know maybe not the enterprise case but for all of the funnels of a uh, users come into weeks and asking hey I just need this at one more thing here they maybe we can have some AI that would help them and solve this this need but the potential is actually going much more than that what if you're going to ask a website make my website okay. create the whole website for me make a good looking design for my website choose the team of my website do the layout of my page maybe do even my campaign on social you know, promote my website. Uh, it will bring us into a very interesting challenge. So what if, let's say I have a website that an AI has created and then I'm, a, I'm asking another AI, optimize my website for a SEO for, so that uh, the social and Google bots would really, really like it. And A, there, there, that side, in Google, there's an AI that tries to look at the site and see if it works a uh, looking at and promoting it or not in terms when when you search for something and then you might have another AI that's going to try and create the right ad so it will be promoted with the right keywords on Google and all of that is, is happening you know yeah, yeah it's going to happen and then we're going to have an AI trying to optimize get around what another AI understands and we'll see what where that's going on but I think that if we're going back for a real problem, We don't know how to measure beauty. What is beautiful? We don't know how to measure that. We don't know how to measure what is a, a good website. We do know how to measure what is a good website in terms of traffic coming to it and in terms of conversions. But that is, a, almost, that is almost secondary. Do we know how to say what would be the best website for me to sell my unique shoes? Hmm. Maybe the machine will know. Maybe. Maybe that's where AI would come into, into play. And, uh, so I, I think that, you know, generative AI uh, will hit us in, in so many forms uh, and, and, and so many domains. Uh, and as, as we see, it's all, it also, you know, the evolution is very, very fast. Like the GPT 4.0, <clears throat> came out just a few months after a previous version, but still taking the power of the generative AI and uh, adapt it to a specific domain, since as when you have a wide domain, the, the AI will uh, uh, be less effective, uh, probably on the long tail, but also on the mid tail. It will have half-truth, uh, mm-hmm. inaccuracies. So I believe that companies that will know to tame The generative AI and as you said what is a beautiful website what is an effective website what is a usable website and how the the three dimension correlates I believe that this is something that the, the web companies can narrow down for the AI and and, and build the specific models and I think that's the, that's the next big thing in our industry yeah and yeah you know, Like people are saying in all of the, those conferences when saying the big next thing so I'm going to repeat the same the same uh, is. buzzword is that a company that does invest in AI will have a problem yeah well that's that's the life today okay um, so mo- more about uh, AI so it will also you know impact the way we develop anything n- not related to, to web. Um, what do you think the essential skills for developer at the age of AI 
And how is Wix uh, preparing its uh, developers to this uh, new phase? I think one, one skill is first to understand AI. Because developers will need to understand what is AI and how, how can they utilize it. I think we are not really sure yet how AI will impact developer work itself, the way the developer actually works. We do have things like sidecar and things like that, but they're still relatively minor compared to the real work of a developer. And I think, I, let's say it this way, I see potential in some areas. You know, software quality, there are five pillars of what is software quality. It's availability, that you'll get an answer from your software. Yeah. It is correctness, that you'll get the right answer. Latency, that you'll get an answer in the right time. Error rate is what is the chance that you'll get an error that you didn't expect. And usability, are you able to use the software? And out of those five, we are very good at measuring three of them. But we have no idea to measure correctness and how to measure usability. You know, think about any API that you have ever, ever seen. How do you measure automatically correctness that it gives the right answer? You know, yeah. the only way to do that is to ask a, a human. Or and, ask it many, many, many times and, uh, you know, statistically say something about it. But you do need to have some benchmark for that because it might be that if you get some, some different type of response, it might be correct or it might not be correct. How do you know? And the same question goes to, hey, you have an API. And, and, and intentionally, I'm talking about an API because we're talking about a developer. Is the API usable? Can, so how do you measure usability of an API? Usability yeah, is yeah, about people. Yeah. And those are two places where if we can get that fast feedback from an AI on those two, two subjects, that would be very interesting for us developers and make our life much easier. It will also remove a lot of the friction we get in, in integrations because guess what? A lot of the friction in integrations is around those two questions, correctness and usability. Do you have children? Yes. Uh, are they using a mobile phone? One of them. One of them. Yeah. Uh, are you using a desktop computer? Desktop? They know. No. Laptops. Laptop. They're using laptops? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. But you can see that most of our children today use mobile, and most of them don't really use a laptop. So how would you program 10 years from now without a laptop on a mobile? How would that look like? And the, the development in, in fuels will be much more abstract. You're going to take your phone yeah, and tell, tell your AI, I want to write a program that is that, exactly. this, 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 and that. And then you might have a way in your mobile to review something and say, hey, that's right. Go and submit that. Yeah. And I think that's the real future of programming because that's the tools that people have today that, that people are learning to use today. What advice can you give to early stage uh, entrepreneurs when building their uh, technological roadmap and yeah, take into account all the amazing AI stuff that we've just discussed? I, uh, I would say three things. One, use the tools you know. That's the most important thing. Because if you use the, the tools you know, you already saved a lot of time. Second thing, use Velo. That's the fastest way to build any kind of user interface. It would allow you to uh, have a product in two months instead of two years. Starting, use AI. Figure out where, how, and where you can use AI, even if that helps you. Even if it's only to tell your investors to add AI somewhere in your pitch because that helps you to get money, but it also has a lot of potential to probably help you in a real way and figure out what's the right way to do that. Keep in mind that it's an entrepreneur, At the end of the game, you're fighting with probably other 10 companies that have the same idea, and it's important to have the best execution, not only the best idea, and use the tools to do that. That's why what you know is great because it may make you much more proficient in what you're doing. Velo for UI helps you to make the to be much more productive on, on your user interface and use UI tools to save time, get the... You know, shortcuts whenever you can. 
So now to the last section, Q and Tech. What's your favorite tech term or buzzword? Continuous delivery. What's a tech term or buzzword you find overrated or annoying? Revolution. What's on your bookshelf at the moment? It's a book about quantum uh, computing. Uh, next one, if you could switch careers and work in any other field, what would it be? It would, all, it would, be, quite, uh, it would be high energy physics. Uh, fifth question, if you could ask any tech figure, past or present, any question, who would it be and why? It would be a guy who wrote a book I read in 98, which kind of taught me how to predict the future in technology. And I actually learned microservices from him 10 years before microservices were created. So that's amazing. I don't remember his name, but that would be the guy. Okay, let's ask the GPT later. If you were stranded on a desert island with only one piece of tech, what would it be? Definitely a laptop, probably Mac. Great. So it was a pleasure uh, having you today. You have a very interesting talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you. Executive State of Mind. Exec- Executive State of Mind. Executive State of Mind.